we come to this point where we are to receive the word, the Amen. spoken word. We have before us this day, Reverend Randolph, who will deliver the word so that we can receive it in our hearts and then open us up to the invitation of discipleship. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. certainly want to celebrate and appreciate the great pastor of this church, the Reverend Melvin F. Sharon II, Amen. who has graciously allowed one of your humble servants to stand behind this historic and sacred desk of the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, we thank him. We pray, pray, pray blessings upon him and his family. And we grant him traveling grace, traveling mercy, traveling love, and traveling peace. Amen. There is a word from the Lord this morning. Amen. 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 And I would ask that if you have your Bibles, we will stand and read the word of the Lord from 2 Samuel chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 9, beginning at verses 1 through 12. That's 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. If you have it, say amen. amen. If you don't have it, say hold up. Wait a minute. Oh, somebody else ain't holding it. Hold it too. Yes. So these are the words that are written in the text. Chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. David asked, Is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? 
Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, He is at the house of Micaiah, son of Amiel, in Lodibar. So King David had him brought from Lodibar, from the house of Micaiah, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, he said, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all of the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Mm -hmm. Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth's grandson of your master will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever the Lord the king, my Lord the king commands the servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's, David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to preach or teach this morning with this subject in our mind. Blessed in my brokenness. Blessed in my brokenness. Beloved, one of the fundamental questions we ask in life is, who am I? We ask this question of our friends, our acquaintances, associates, family, and yes, we even ask this question of God. We seek answers that will validate who we are, where we've been, and where we see ourselves going. My simplistic answer to this question is, and my truest non-negotiable identity is the beloved of the Lord. You may say I'm this, you may say I'm that. Books may say I'm this, my record may say I'm that. But at the end of the day, I am the beloved of the Lord. In spite of my checkered past, my fabulous flops, my painful history, my deepest flaws, my boneheaded mistakes, and yes, even beyond my unqualified beliefs about myself, at the end of the day, I am God's beloved. Right. This is my foundational identity. And the foundational identity of the truth be told of all of humanity. This is important, church, because your identity is the engine that drives the relationship, not only with ourselves, but also with God. If your identity is broken, your life becomes broken. If you define yourself incorrectly, you will carry that wrong definition into your story. And trust me, we all have a story. If you see your limitations, if all you see are your limitations, you will miss out on the stunning possibilities God is creating right in front of you. 
If you see yourself as less than, you will, you will miss out what God says about you that is greater than. In the counseling arena, when I'm working with hurting people, probably the most tragic thing that I witness is when they have accepted the lie and that whatever ugly, can't talk about it, embarrassing thing that has happened in their story is beyond the grace of God. That's not so. No matter what it is, no matter what has been done, no matter how it has been said, what has not been said, what was misspoken, not spoken, done and not done, it is never beyond the grace of God. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. And somebody here today, whether you're in the congregation or whether you're alive, has been given an unqualified diagnosis by an unqualified individual based on the rumblings and the, of a disqualified and defeated enemy. Who says that God's hand of mercy doesn't reach far enough? God's hand of mercy. His grace is just beyond. Beyond the quiet addiction to pain kills. Beyond the shame of unexpected divorce. Beyond someone's sexuality and all what that means. Beyond the betrayal of a family member. Beyond the fear of growing old and being alone. Beyond a secret abortion or sorrows of miscarriages. Beyond the depression. Beyond the sadness. Beyond the eating disorder. Beyond the drinking. Beyond the bad choices. Beyond the hidden regrets that you chose your career over your family. But I stopped by on a Sunday morning to let someone know that God is still reaching out. Betwixt yeah. and between all the painful moments and the counterfeit whispers, God says, just reach back to me. Ah. Beloved, I am here. Reach back. I am with you. Yeah. Reach back. I am always there. Reach back. <coughs> just reach back to me. Because I'm able to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than you can ask, more than you can think. More than you can imagine. Is there anybody here this morning that knows what I'm talking about? Hallelujah. God says just reach back in your sickness. Reach back in your pain. Reach back even in your brokenness. God says reach back. I am here. Child of God, try me. See if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you will not have room to receive. A blessing pressed down. A blessing shaking together. A blessing running over. Running over in your life. Running over in your health. Running over in your finances. Running over with loving kindness. And the question for all of us on this Sunday morning. <clears throat> how does God bless us ah. in the midst of brokenness? Ah. Mm -hmm. You're writing, here's the first principle I will lift for you this morning. God will always reposition your brokenness before he blesses you in and through your brokenness. Yeah. Let me say that again. God will always reposition your brokenness mm -hmm. before he blesses you in and through your brokenness. Yes, yes. When you read the Bible, beloved, you will discover that more often than not, that whenever the Lord is about to do something, whenever the Lord is about to fix something, whenever the Lord is about to do a new thing, whenever he is about to bless someone or in a particular way heal someone. Yeah. In the biblical text will clearly identify instructions for repositioning to receive the healing and the blessing of the Lord. Okay, you don't believe me? I'll prove it. All right. In Genesis 12 and 1, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land that I will show you. Repositioned. 
In 2 Kings 5 and 14, Elijah sent Naaman to dip in the Jordan seven times. Read. Yeah. In John 9 and 7, Jesus told the blind man, go wash in the pool of Salon. Reposition. In Mark 8 and 23, Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village and put spittle on his eyes and he was healed. He too. Yes. Was repositioned. Yes. Your blessing, your miracle, your breakthrough is always more often than not tied to your location. Yeah. It's something about old folks who just say, you better quit being in the wrong place. Yeah. At the wrong, wrong time, time. There's something wrong gonna happen to you. Yeah. I don't know. That's what that my, my, my folks used to tell me in Florida. <laughs> you be careful being where you ain't supposed to be. All right. That, that, that was my story. When I was a kid, I used to, anyway, we ain't going to go there. <laughs> but the truth, beloved, is that some of us oh, yeah. are still out of place. Yeah. Yes. Some of us have remained in places and spaces and situations and relationships the Lord told us to leave a long time ago. Yeah. Watch this. Yeah. We have become so comfortable in our dysfunction that the fear of the unknown, the fear of change, the fear of brokenness, the fear of something as simple as a vaccine has many of us and others stuck. Stuck. I finished that, but I'm in the church. I'm going to finish that. The Lord told you to leave that job. But we say, no, they are my friends. Mm -hmm. Friends are not only holding you back, but they're stabbing you in the back. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Reposition yourself. Ah. Yeah. You've been engaged for six years. He put a ring on it, but that's all he's done. Ah. Reposition yourself. You left that toxic relationship, but you're still calling them to see if they okay. Right. Put the phone down ah. and reposition yourself. God has not given us a spirit of fear. The Lord has a blessing with your name on it if we would just trust, believe, and reposition ourselves. The text this morning, chapter 9, verse 1, parenthetically, David asked the question, is there anyone left in Saul's family that I can bless Based on my covenant, based on my relationship, based on my love for John. Ah. If you look at chapter 8, you will discover that David had just crushed the Philistines with a great victory. God had blessed him, and David thought it not robbery to bless somebody else. Thank you. Thank you. It's always good to bless somebody Thank else. You. Here's a public service announcement. And it's a major lesson for us this morning. When the Lord blesses you, it's not about you. Right. Amen. It's about can you be trusted to bless someone else and give God his glory? Amen. Are you spiritually mature enough to handle the blessings of the Lord? The blessings of the Lord are never singular in purpose. They are always plural. It's never just about you. It's about you and it's about someone else. It's about you and it's about the Lord. It's never just about you. It's about you, God, and the testimony that you shall give so God can get his glory. Yeah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Back to the text. The text Zebra told David that there was a son of Jonathan crippled in both feet, living in the home of Micaiah, son of Amiel in Lodibar. The Bible declares that David immediately sent for him. He was living in Lodabar, which means having no pasture, which means a wasteland. Ah. It's a place of forgotten people, yeah. a place where you would find the least, the lost, the left out, the left behind, the unskilled, the uneducated, the outcast of society, a place where Mephibosheth was living in somebody else's house. Ah. He was living in a place of squalor. I see. He was living in Lodabar, but it wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault his father died. It wasn't his fault he was crippled. It wasn't his fault 
the doctor did not heal him. It wasn't his fault. He was living in Lodabar. Church, ah. Lodabar ah. is not just a physical location. Watch me now. All right. Lodabar is also an existential location mm -hmm. re relating to your self perceived mental, emotional, spiritual condition of existence. Ah. And some of us are existential residents of Lodabar. Mm -hmm. In other words, what do you believe about yourself? Do you compare and contrast yourself with the standards of this world? What do you believe? The world says you are too light or too dark. The world says too tall or too short. The world says too rich or too poor. Mm. The world says too fat or too skinny. Nah. The world says not pretty enough. Uh. Or do you believe what God's word says you are? All right. The word says you are made in the image and likeness of God. The uh, word no, says no. you are made just a little lower than the angels. The word says that you are the head and not the tail, the lender and not the borrower. What do you believe this morning? Hallelujah. And there might be someone here today who by chance or happenstance finds themselves living and negotiating the outskirts of Lodabar. You didn't ask for this. You did nothing wrong. He didn't put in an application to go to Lodabar. Uh -huh. And can I tell you, Lodabar does not discriminate. Black, white living in Lodabar. Rich, poor living in Lodabar. Educated, uneducated, residing in Lodabar. Saved and unsaved living in Lodabar. You didn't ask that man or woman to walk away from you. You did not ask for that sickness in your body. You did not ask for mental illness. You did not ask for that addiction. You did not ask to be laid off your job. You did not ask for death to visit your family. You did not ask to lose that house or that car or for your children to act like they lost their last mind. You did not ask for church hurt. You did not ask to negotiate the terms and conditions of the Bible. All right. But just like Mephibosheth in the text, God's got a way. Hey, when you least expect it, God will reposition you into your place of blessing. You might not see it coming. Somebody said, he may not come when you want him, but what? That's what I'm talking about. God will reposition your thoughts and relocate you emotionally, mentally or physically to your place of blessing. And there might be someone sitting right next to you that can testify about the goodness of the Lord. Yeah. God healed your body. Yes, he did. Hallelujah. Oh, they walked down on you, but God sent a godly man or woman in your life. Yes, he did. Hallelujah. God took addiction from you and allowed you to taste and see that the Lord is good. Yeah. Yes, he did. Everything. You lost that job, but God gave you a better job. Or watch this. Gave you your own business. Ah. Yes, he did. You lost a car or a house, but God put another roof over your head and another car in your driveway. Yes, he did. Ah. Your children were acting like baby kids. Ah. But the word of the Lord is true. If you train a child up in the way they should go, yeah. and when they get older, when they get older, yeah. when they get older, yeah. somebody knows that yeah. when they get older, is there anybody that can testify? Yeah. There is no secret yeah. what God can do. Yeah. What he's done for the others, for the least, for the lost, for the left out, for the left behind, he'll do for you. Can I get the people of God to praise God? Say yes, he will. Next principle of your writing. Yes, Lord. When God decides to elevate you in and from 
your place of brokenness, yes, he will always use unseen resources and unlikely people. Yes. 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 Hallelujah. He will always use unseen resources mm. yes. and unlikely people. In the text, the Bible says, beginning in verse 6, when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, who was the son of Saul, came before David, he bowed deeply, uh, basing himself, honoring David. David said to him, Mephibosheth, he said, yes, 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 sir. Notice the response of Mephibosheth in verse 8. The Message Bible puts it like this. Mm -hmm. Shuffling and stammering, not looking him in the eye. Mephibosheth said, who am I that you pay attention to a stray dog like me? Ah, he saw it. himself as a stray dog. A stray dog. Not just a dog, but a stray dog. A stray dog ain't got no home. A stray dog ain't got no help. A stray dog is scratching and clawing for everything they can find. Mm. A stray dog in the dog world is a criminal. Yep. Watch this. He was in the house of David, the king. He was no longer physically in Lodabar. But mentally, he was stuck in Lodabar. This is a powerful word for someone today. Watch the text. Listen to what he says. Who am I that you pay attention to a stray dog like me? He was out of Lodabar physically, but mentally he was still in Lodabar. He was still a prisoner in his own mind. He was depressed. He was clinically depressed. He was out of Lodabar. He was in the king's house at the king's table, yeah. receiving the blessings of the king, but he physically was removed, but he was mentally stuck. Yeah. And yeah. here's another public service announcement. I can't speak for you. I don't know about you. I'm talking about me right now. And if, but if all your strength walk with me. Beloved, there have been times when we are in conflict with friends, family, and in conflict with others. Yes. Listen to me. You will never be able to receive the blessings of God until you allow yourself to see yourself the way God sees you. If you always see yourself where other folk tell you you are, because people will, will take behaviors and make them the actuality, totality of you, who you are. Right. A behavior is learned. That's not who you are. Until you open your heart, you will never allow God or anyone else to love you, bless you, and even forgive you. Some of us, God has forgiven a long time ago for what we did a long time ago, and we still kicking ourselves. We're still holding ourselves back. We are still saying this, that, and the third. We're still punishing ourselves. And God said, why don't you let it go? I did. Ah, yeah. Amen. Yeah. But we are caught up by what other folk do. Mm -hmm. Listen, kids in school can be cruel, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Adults can be cruel too. That's right. <laughs> and I don't know who this is for, but God wants you to know. He does not see you through the lens of your sins or brokenness. God sees you through the lens of his love, through yes. the lens of his mercy, yes. through the lens of his grace, yes. and through the lens of Calvary's cross. Hallelujah. He's knocking on the door. Let him in. Tell your neighbor, let him in. Yes. And there might be at least 10 people here this morning wow. that wants to let Amen. him in. Hallelujah. Back to the text. David said to Mephibosheth, I am returning you all the properties that your grandfather saw, which suggests not only is there a new blessing, but he's getting back what has been taken from him. He's getting back what was lost. 
getting back to all the stuff that David, watch this, has been holding for him that belong to him and more. All right. He's getting back all the lands. He's getting back all the property. He's getting back all the servants, getting back the livestock, everything that belonged to his grandfather Saul. He's getting it back. Oh, this is good. When Saul had the lands, when Saul had the property, there were wars and rumors of wars. Am I right? When Saul had the servants, when Saul had the livestock, Saul was under attack physically and politically, and he was under attack in his own house. But David is now giving it all back to Mephibosheth. He's giving it back to him. Watch this. But when David gives it back to him, there are no physical or political threats against Mephibosheth. Yeah. What am I saying? And, and this is for somebody here today. God has a way yeah. of not only giving you back what the enemy stole from you, but when he gives it back, it's in better shape. Wow. It's in better shape. It's in better shape than it was when the enemy took it. Hallelujah. Who am I preaching to? Hallelujah. Is there anybody that knows he will give you double for your trouble? Anybody knows of his mercy? Anybody knows of his grace? Anybody knows about his loving kindness? Tell your neighbor, won't he do it? Or tell your neighbor on the other side, won't he do it? You ought to take about 10 seconds and give God praise for the great things he's done. Unseen resources and unlikely people. Watch the text. Mephibosheth says, I'm a stray dog. He averted his eyes. He would not look David in the eye. He said, I'm a stray dog, which means in his mind, not only is he a lame dog, but he's a stray dog, meaning he's without friends, without family, and without a place to call home. Ah, Have you ever felt like you were all alone? Yes. Have you ever felt like you had family, but your family did not have you. Yeah. Have you ever felt like, as Luther would say, your house is not a home? Yeah. Have you ever felt some kind of way? But I stopped by to let you know that there is someone closer than a brother. Yeah. There is someone closer than a father. There is someone closer than your ride or die. Yeah. Someone who's able to exceedingly abundantly more you can ask. More than you can think, more than you can imagine. He said, come learn of me. My yoke is easy. My burdens are light. He said, in me you will find a home, a resting place. He said, lo, I will be with you, not just today, but always. Somebody say, yes, he will. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Well, I'm done. <laughs> But based on our current exegetical interpretation of the biblical text, God will bless us in our brokenness by repositioning our brokenness before he blesses us in and through our brokenness. Then he will elevate us in and from our place of brokenness. He will use and develop unseen resources and unlikely people. And finally, if you're writing text in or tweeting, when God blesses you in your brokenness, those who counted you out ah, yeah. will need you to count them in. Ah, yeah. Let me say that again. Those persons, those communities, those organizations who counted you out will depend on you to count them in. Hallelujah. In verse 9 and subsequently verse 10, the text says David then called Ziba, Saul's right hand man, and told him everything that belonged to Saul and his family. I'm handed over to your master's grandson, Mephibosheth himself, your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants will work his land and bring in his produce, bring in his provisions. For your master's grandson. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. David called Saul right hand man. 
And right in front of Mephibosheth, he flips the script. David the king validates Mephibosheth's pedigree. He validates his status and says, Zeba, you and your sons and servants will now become servants of Mephibosheth. In other words, Zeba, you knew who Mephibosheth was. Yeah, yeah. You knew yeah, yeah. where he was. Yeah. You knew how I felt about David, about Jonathan and his family. Ah. You knew he was in Lodabar, but didn't lift a finger to help ah. him. Wow. You would not serve him. Yeah. You have 15 sons and 20 servants. They're going to serve him. No one, you, you got all these folks, but no one checked on Mephibosheth. No one brought Mephibosheth a happy meal. No one checked to see if his phone had minutes. No one checked to see if his child needed anything. Now, you if you go back, watch me now, to chapter 18, you will discover that the Bible says that David's soul was knitted to the soul of John. Ziba knew about this. Ziba knew that David would not kill Mephibosheth. Ziba knew that his land and servants really belonged to Mephibosheth. Yeah. The heir of Jonathan, yeah. the heir of Saul. But Ziba knew he was holding what belonged to someone else. Ziba was not only a thief, he was a hater. Mm. Ah. And God has a way of making your hater your elevator. Ah. Yeah. Somebody knows yeah. about that. Amen. Those who count you out need you to count them in. David is saying, Ziba, servant of Saul, all the land, all the crops, all the livestock, all the service you got from Saul, I'm giving them to Mephibosheth. Ziba needed for Mephibosheth, who he counted out, to count him in. All right. And someone needs to know today, God has a way of making your haters your elevators. Can I get a witness? Hallelujah. But not only that, the text says he will, Mephibosheth will eat at the king's table. Yes. And not only that, Ziba will have to prepare the table. Ah. He will prepare a table in the presence of what? Yes. My enemies. Everyone in Ziba's house, including Ziba, became the servants of Mephibosheth. What I'm saying, God has a way of preparing a place for you in the presence of those who discounted you. In the presence of the ones who conspired against you. In the presence of the ones who rejected you. In the presence of those who talked about you. In the presence of those who lied on you. In the presence of those who used you. In the presence of those who abused you. In the presence of your haters. In the presence of those who counted you out. In the presence of those who need you to count them in. In the lesson this morning, we discover Mephibosheth who was lame in both feet, residing in a place of repugnance, of residing in a place of barrenness, residing in a place called Lodabar. However, he is repositioned, he is rescued, he is revived as a result of a covenant between David and his father. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 18, there was a covenant between King David and Jonathan, Mephibosheth's father. And the good news for all of us today is that there was another covenant <coughs> between another king and his father. In the New Testament, there was a covenant between King Jesus All right. and his father. Yeah. Let me say that again. Yeah. There was another covenant between King Jesus yeah. and his father. Hallelujah. King Jesus brought Mephibosheth to his house. King David, rather, brought Mephibosheth to his house. King Jesus wants to bring all of us into his house. King David gave Mephibosheth back what Ziba stole. King Jesus will give you back everything that the enemy stole. Ah, yeah. King David prepared a place for Mephibosheth at his table. King Jesus prepares a place for us at his table. Your enemies, your haters, your adversaries will have to watch you eat at the king's table yeah. where the feast of the Lord is going on. 
I don't know who this is for this morning, but the Holy Spirit is saying, your season of loss, your season of lack, your season of loneliness, your season representative of Lodibar in your life is coming to an end. Oh, you ought to shout about Hallelujah. that. Hallelujah. It's coming to an end. Hallelujah. Yes, it is. Hallelujah. Give God praise Hallelujah. because he's bringing you out. Give God praise because he's bringing you out. Give God praise because that's who he is. You gotta praise him. Hallelujah. Just because who he is. I don't always have to praise him because he brings me out. I can praise him just because of who he is. I can praise him because he's out there and awake. I can praise him because he's the beginning and the end. I can praise him because he's the lily of the valley. I can praise him because he's the bright morning star. I can praise him. Because he's the Rose of Sharon. I can praise him because he's the Prince of Peace. I can praise him because he's the King of Kings. I can praise him because he's the Lord of Lords. And he is Jehovah Jireh. He is Jehovah Shammah. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is Jehovah Sikhanu. He is Jehovah Nisi. He is Jehovah Shalom. And... Uh, he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me that I am his own. Not my mama. She already in glory. Not my daddy. He in glory too. I am his own. His own if I'm sad. His own if I'm broke. His own if I'm sick. His own if I'm divorced. His own if I'm in trouble. His own if I sin. His own if I'm broke. In the lesson this morning, we see that Mephibosheth was broken, lame in both feet, living in a desolate place called Lodabar. However, the Bible tells us that because his father made a covenant with King David, sometime later, he was repositioned in the king's house. Well, church, in the gospel of John, chapter 17, King Jesus made a covenant with his father in the garden of Gethsemane. Yeah. A covenant that says, we are heirs and joint heirs. A covenant that says, we have a seat at the table. A covenant that says that he will be with you always. A covenant that says <laughs> there is no place that you can go that the love and the mercy of God shall not be able to reach you. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God may not come, church. Thank you, Lord. Every time here, call him. But I promise you. He ain't never late. He ain't never late. And we're all standing. We're all standing. We're all standing. So, the truth is, if you live on this side of the Jordan, you're going to go through something. You're going to go through some pain. You're going to be hurt sometimes. You're going to get sick sometimes. I know we're in a COVID environment. And some people have COVID. They contracted COVID. I may have COVID myself. But guess what? COVID doesn't have me. Jesus has me. So even in our brokenness, even in our sadness, even in this economic whatever it is, even when the government has lost their mind, the Bible says the government shall be upon his neck, his throat, his shoulders. But Jesus there ain't nothing too hard for Jesus. I might have a witness to that. So, I invite you in virtual space. 
those of us who are standing here today. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know if you're in Lodabar or not. But whatever you're going through, I recommend Jesus. Whatever you're in need of, I recommend Jesus. Whatever you've done or didn't do, whatever's coming against you, I recommend Jesus. So there's three categories. If you, if you have not come to know Jesus and the pardon of your sins, deacons are in the house tonight, to get this morning. Raise your hand and they'll come talk to you. Hallelujah. And tell you about he who is able to keep you from falling. They'll tell you about Jesus. And then there's a second category. You may know Jesus and you may love Jesus. And you are a born again Christian. But you are going somewhere or watching somewhere just where you go. But you're not going where you have the opportunity to grow. So, while I recommend Jesus, I recommend Great Hope Baptist Church as a place where baptized believers will embrace you and love on you yeah. and tell you how the Lord has been good to them. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Hallelujah. And the third and final chapter is that those who are members of this branch of Zion or members somewhere else and you have fallen down, slipped, Found yourself in Lord of But I say to you, you can reestablish your relationship with God. Because the truth is, no matter what you've done, God has never left you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Just come on back. Thank you. Rededicate your life to Him. And I promise you, there is nothing that God can't do. He will rock you in the bosom of his mother arms. He'll sleep with you when you're alone. He'll comfort you when you're in a crisis. He will talk to you when you can't understand what everybody else is saying. He is our Lord and Savior.
Tell me we thank the musicians and the choir. The musicians and the choir is separate atmosphere. So we know God is already here, but when they set the atmosphere, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Yes. And that's what that's how that's received the Lord's benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. To present us faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. The only wise God, our Father, dominion, majesty, and power from this time forth and even forevermore. Let the church say, Amen. God bless you, go in peace.